So today we are going to deal with the ophthalmology instruments and uh, uh, my purpose to deal with the ophthalmology instruments are dual. Like you know that uh, so many times in the practicals and the viva these instruments are kept and uh, you have been asked to identify the instruments and you have to tell its uses. But the second reason why I want to discuss the instruments is that while you are going through the theory of ophthalmology there are so many procedures that you study there are so many steps that you are studying so it becomes slightly cumbersome to understand those surgeries or to understand those steps until and unless you have the sound knowledge of the instruments so let's begin with the first one so in the first one i am beginning uh, with the very basic instrument and that is one instrument that you use a uh, maximum of the times so can you see this what is this actually this instrument is a universal spaculum it is called as the spaculum now the reason why it is called as universal because you know when we use other speculums we have to use separate like we have to use a separate for the right eye separate for the left eye but this speculum can be used in the either eye so that is why it is called as universal speculum and what is the actual purpose of the speculum is to widen the eye you have to open the eye so that you can do the procedures so this can be used for the very basic when you are doing the enucleation surgery the evisceration surgery the destructive procedures then a very very common thing that you see in the OPDs that uh, you have to remove a foreign body. Now what happens when there is a foreign body uh, maybe in the conjunctiva or in the cornea obviously there is lot of lacrimation, lot of redness, congestion, patient is in pain. So it becomes difficult for the patient to open his eye wide and let you remove that foreign body. So for that purpose we also require the eye speculum at the time of removing the foreign bodies and I think this is one of the very common uses of the speculum because every day when you are there in the OPD, I think there must be some patients and everybody who is posted in the OPDs or uh, who has already passed or maybe doing the internship posting in the OFTEL will agree to me that like foreign body is one very very common case that you get in the OFTEL OPDs. So that time also we use it. Then third thing, uh, uh, another important thing is the corneal ulcers. Like uh, we have got a lot of cases of the corneal ulcer, especially the bacterial ulcers. So at that time also when we want to do the cauterization of the ulcers, we want to remove uh, this uh, corneal debris, then also we use these via speculums okay so first of all uh, let's go through it it is a universal speculum can be used for both the eyes and it is used to separate the eyelids for, uh, when you are going under uh, your patient is undergoing any intraocular surgery uh, one very important advantage of the speculum is that it is self retaining otherwise uh, you have to get hold of some person uh, a person assisting you you he, you, you uh, actually will hold this so it's self retaining so you, you independently can do it and it's very very lightweight so patient compliance is again very very good so whenever you are doing any intraocular surgery extraocular surgeries you require this speculum so that is the purpose i started with this because the moment you are into the procedures whether it's in the opd or whether it's in the ot you have to know this all right so this was your first one now let's see the second one this is what you called as a forceps now you already know that uh, what is a forcep and what is a caesar right so you have to actually concentrate on the 
forceps in order to find out that what kind of forceps it is or what kind of scissors it is. So, looking at the instrument, can you see this is a forceps? So, we already know this. Okay. Now, in order to identify, see back, that is the handle portion can be different. Uh, maybe it can be due to the manufacturer's um, quality and designs. So, basically for the identification, never go and see the handles, always see the tips. So, it is actually the tips that will help you to identify the instruments and that is the basic secret or I can say the basic logic of identifying the instrument. So, can you see a very important uh, tip to remember this is, can you see the S shaped curve here. So, this S shaped curve is actually because it is a superior rectus holding forceps. So, you are getting a double curve, double curved at the end. So, S for S, remember that you are getting the S shaped curve in the superior rectus holding forceps all right so what you are getting a very big tooth you are getting a very big tooth in this portion you are getting so that you can get hold it is something like this so this s shaped curve is having a single tooth here so that you can hold whole of the superior rectus belly and uh, you know if you remember like now how to apply your theory whatever you learn in theory is just not the cramming it up you have to apply it now if you remember what we learn in mills what we learn in mills what was it it was 5.5 6.5 6.9 and 7.7 7 right so these were the distances of the rectus muscles which were from the limbus when they are inserting into the sclera so can you see here for the superior rectus it is 7.7 .7. so what is its first angle at so where it is bended it is bended at a distance of 7.7 .7 mm so can you see the logic so you don't have to cram it up because you already know that the distance of the superior rectus from the limbus is 7.7 .7 mm so, uh, when do you require the superior rectus holding forceps? Obviously, when I want to lift the superior rectus and I want to pass a brittle suture, right? Uh, when do we have to do it? A very, very common thing when we are doing the cataract surgery, what happens? When we do the cataract surgery, suppose uh, this is the eye here. Okay, so if this is the superior area, why I am saying this is the superior area? Because as a uh, surgeon, we are actually standing on the head end of the patient. So, patient is lying like this in front of me and suppose I as a surgeon is standing here. So, I require this area for doing the incisions and the other things. So, I require this area for that I will have to lift up the superior rectus. So, for that purpose, I will use it not only for the cataract but also for the glaucoma surgery. Then another important thing is when you are doing any other surgery, maybe you may be requiring the stabilization of the eyeball. I think that is a very important thing. Uh, the moment you want to do anything over the eye, the first important challenge is the stabilization because you cannot manipulate, you cannot do anything over the eyeball which is not stable. So, you want to pass a superior rectus brittle suture, be it the cataract surgery, be it the glaucoma surgery or you want to stabilize the eyeball, then we are using this S shaped S for S superior rectus having a bent at 7.7 .7 mm. Is that very clear? Right? Alright. Now, see this. Now, can you see this is not a forceps okay this is a caesar now it's a typical kind of caesar can you see uh, it is not looking like a normal caesar we have so this is actually a spring caesar it is a conjunctival spring caesar and uh, as far as the tip is concerned we can have a sharp tip or a blunt tip 
Now, why this is called as spring season? Spring season means this season is working with a spring. So, can you see here? Can you see here? The blades are actually apart like this. Why? Because there is a spring action. So, when we are actually cutting the conjunctiva, see, for making the flap, you require that spring action, otherwise it will be uh, becoming very, very uh, traumatic kind of dissection when you want to make a conjunctival sap. And so, it's its use. See, in order to cut the conjunctiva for making the conjunctival flap. So, for this, you know, you already know that what are the steps of the cataract surgery. This is the first thing that we keep on learning while we are doing the lens in the cataract. That first you have to make the incision, corneoscleral incision and for making that you have to do the cutting of the conjunctiva. So, now you can correlate for this I require spring kind of action, right. For that uh, it will be easier. Like for example, if you remember in our uh, first first years when we used to do the anatomy dissection, some amount of dissection that was called as a blunt dissection was done by our fingers only. So, can you see this is again a spring kind of action that we used to do for the blunt dissection. So, the in eye the blunt dissection obviously cannot be done with the help of a finger. So, the, here we are using this conjunctival spring scissors. So, if you remember its name and if, if you see its tip, this moment you see the open tip you will uh, remember that it is like this, that is the spring action, all right. Now, we come to the other one. Now, what is this? Now, again, you can see that this is a forceps. So, half of the name you already know that this is a forceps and if you look at the tip, what is this? Now, can you see the tip is not uh, sharp? it is not having any tooth. That means it is not for any dissection, it is not for um, uh, lifting anything because of its blunt end. Can you see they are just like hands, like uh, if you hold anything with hands, the shape is something like this. So, this is actually your globe fixation forceps. Uh, though it has got tooth, but they are at its inner tip and uh, if you see from the outer aspect, they are, they are just like this, they are holding the glow from both the sides. So, basically their use is the stabilization of the glow and uh, why we actually require this? As I told you that the moment you want to do anything over the eyeball, stabilization is very, very important. So, when I want to hold the conjunctival tissue for cutting or when I want to um, make some conjunctival flap, so all that time or when you are making a tunnel, like when we do the SICS and I want to make a tunnel, so that requires lot amount of intervention there, lot of uh, manipulations there. So first we require, what you require is the stabilization of the globe. So for all these purposes, we are using this globe stabilization or a fixation forceps. All right. Now see this. I think uh, this is easy to remember as well as to identify. Can you see the electrical part here, right? We have this uh, electrical part and uh, this is very, very commonly used in the cataract surgery. Uh, the moment you give the uh, incision, conjunctiva being very, very vascular, a uh, lot of bleeding can take place and one of the intraoperative complication that you study in cataract surgery is the irregular bleeding, especially in those patients who are having hypertension, especially the uncontrolled hypertension, or they are having some heart disease, the amount of bleeding is very, very high here. And uh, in normal people also, because conjunctiva is a vascular tissue, so when you are giving an incision, uh, the bleeding is expected. So, you have to achieve the hemostasis. So, how will you achieve the hemostasis? For this, we are using the electrocautery and uh, this is uh, given along with this wire. 
Sometimes we only also call it as bipolar diathermy. Bipolar means it has got two poles and on both the sides the wire is there. That's why it is called as a bipolar. So whenever you are making a conjunctival flap, uh, there is a bleeding from there, you are using it. Can you uh, see here the, uh, bra that, uh, the two uh, blades which are coming out they are again just like a forceps here because they have to be applied over the conjunctiva and they should not be very very pointed they should not be having any two there so that you do not cause more and more trauma rather they have uh, they should have some gripping capacity so that what you are doing when you are putting the uh, wire in the uh, electrical socket you are switching it on and you are actually touching it so it, it should be able to hold the um, vessels between the two prongs so it should be like this that is why they are in the form of holding hands holding hands position so uh, the one is like this and the other one is like this and the tissue can be compressed in between the two all right so this is your cautery then coming to the next one now this is the one very common thing everybody recognizes this we have got a blade and a handle so uh, i think uh, this is the first instrument that we uh, hold in the uh, dissection hall and uh, uh, i still remember the moment this um, handle and the scalpel and the blades comes in our hands they, from there we uh, start feeling that yes uh, we are a medico and um, uh, like a lot of people are there which gets uh, um, like a kind of a shock from this and uh, we have seen so many people getting syncopal attack on the dissec uh, dissection table uh, use, uh, seeing these blades or when they see for the first time blood shedding in the OTs. So uh, this scalpel and a blade. So how you are using it? This is called as the Bayard Parker knife handle with a blade. Um, mostly the blades that you are using, they are uh, like 11 number or they are 15 number. And um, basically, this blade is for giving the incision. So, obviously, whenever you are doing the intraocular surgery, you have to give the incision. So, we are uh, using these blades. And the important thing is that uh, when you give the incision uh, in the eye, especially for the intraocular surgery, your hand should be very, very stabilized. Like you don't have a large surface area to give the dissection here, to, uh, to give the incision there. So, you your work a space is a very very limited so you have to go according to that only and it's better if you hold that blade in a pen holding manner like this the reason is that you have a better grip when you hold the blade in in the form of a pen holding manner and we have a command over the uh, the steps that we are doing and we can give the incision but if you are holding it like this like uh, our hand becomes let loose and there can be irregular incisions so that's a good idea of uh, keeping this blade in a pen holding manner so what are its uses see the first and the most important use i will say is to make the corneoscleral incisions in the cataract surgery in fact the most commonly used uh, done surgery in the ophthalmology but at the other places also whenever you uh, are required to give the incision like it can be dcr it can be ptosis entropion ectropion any kind of a surgery we are using the blades but yes again when you uh, are presented uh, in the viva you are sitting in front of examiner and he asked then the first thing that should come to your mouth is the corneoscleral incision in the cataract surgery that is the difference between a theory and a practical practical means first thing first whatever use is the maximum use or the widespread use of that instrument it is much better that you give the most important one use of the instrument rather than the other nine uses so that is the basic difference all right 
Now see the next one. Now see this is again a knife. See this is not a scissor. This is not a forceps. Can you see this? So what is this? This is called as a knife. So if you look, I, I told you that the tip will always guide its name and its use. So if you see here, what is this? It is crescent shape like this. So there goes its name. Very easy. Its name is crescent knife. Its name is crescent knife. And can you see its tip is blunt because if it is pointed then that will be pointing towards a, another instrument that will be your keratome right. So uh, what happens actually uh, in the theory books many times they write interchangeably because sometimes both can be used but uh, practically when it comes to the instrument there is a difference between a keratome and a crescent knife and you have to see the tip of it. So this is having a blunt tip. So basically this blunt tip will help again in making of a plane. So when you are giving the incision by a blade and then you want to make a tunnel. So for the deeper tunnel for making a plane in the cataract surgery you require a blunt kind of a knife that is the use of this crescent knife to make the self-healing sclerocorneal tunnels after making the scleral gutters in the cataract surgery. See, I told you that we don't have the facility of this um, like finger dissection there, blunt dissection. So we have got a lot of blunt instruments in the ophthalm uh, so that after giving the incision, we can make an entry inside, AC entry by a smoother pathway. Right. Now, on the other hand, if you see the other thing, see this one. This is again a knife, but if you look at the tip here, the tip is like this. So, this is at an angle of 45 degree. Like for example, if you remember, we also use a 15 degree blade. So, 15 degree blade we are using as a side port for the side port entry. But this is actually a 45 degree blade. This is called as the keratome, the diamond shaped blade. And this is for the main incision. This is for the main incision, especially when we are doing the phaco emulsification. When we are doing the phaco emulsification. So, uh, this is a curved, a diamond shaped keratome and what is the main use? Main use is when you are making the main incision, especially in cases of the phaco emulsification and after you have made that incision and you want to make that uh, corneoscleral uh, tunnel, you have to go inside, then we are using the crescent knife and uh, sometimes we also use like side port blade in order to make a side port uh, entry if your main incision is very very small. Like you know in that phaco emulsification the main incision is your 3 to 3.5 mm right. But we can do this phaco emulsification with the smaller incisions too. We can have a micro incision less than 2 mm. We can do the phaco knit that is less than 1 mm with the help of the titanium needle. So if you are giving a very small incision uh, in the phaco emulsification, you require a separate side put in order to do the irrigation. So for the irrigation, aspiration and irrigation, you require a separate port and for the main, you are required this. So at that time, we are using one more blade that is your 15 degree side port blade. All right. Now let's see. Now another thing that you require in the cataract surgery, like you have uh, given the incision. First of all, can you follow the steps? We have uh, used the superior rectus holding forceps for passing a brittle suture. Then you have given the incision. You have made the gutter. Then you have made a tunnel with the help of a crescent knife. We also have uh, made the side port entry with the help of a 15 degree blade. Now what next? Next is your capsulotomy. Right, so what uh, we do there, we do the anterior capsulotomy. We do the anterior capsulotomy. So, for doing this anterior capsulotomy, you have to tear the anterior capsule. And what is the name of the dye that we use? That is your Trifan Blue. 
right? This is the blue dye that we are using and that is why it is advised that those people who are having the color related defects, partial or complete, especially for the blue color, should not go for the ophthalmology residency, right? So, many times they are being restricted. So, here we are using the blue dye. Now we know that there are two ways of doing the capsulotomy. Uh, what were the two ways? Like uh, one way was, if you go with the two ways, one way was that you are actually uh, putting a prick in the center and coming towards the periphery and then you are taking it round, 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 round in a curvilinear fashion. So that is called as the continuous curvilinear capsular axis. So for that what you require, you require this bent tip, right. So uh, for with the help of this, if you are using it like this and this has a bent tip, you can tear it from the center, come to the periphery and keep on stretching in a curvilinear fashion. That is continuous uh, curvilinear capsular axis. Or the other way is that you just get a tear in the periphery here and then you go on tearing in the form of a can opener technique. So whatever is the technique that you are using, like uh, you can use it envelope method or CCC method, can opener method, continuous curvilinear method, you have to use the cystitome. Sometimes what happens that this is not available. So even if it is not available, we can use a um, sleek needle there uh, and uh, that uh, we can slightly bend with the help of a forceps, we can slightly bend the tip of this. Uh, uh, many a times like you know when you are a fresher, you um, require every single instrument in the tray only then you can start but uh, slowly and gradually you start learning doing with the things so we used to see how srs can do even with less instruments so they used to use this needle and they used to just bend the tip somehow uh, with the help of a forceps and you can uh, use it in the form of a cystitome all right now see another forceps now can you see here the bent is not S shaped, it is much more um, curved here. The steep curve is present here. So this is the typical which is called as the Macpherson forceps. So this is actually a fine forceps, right? So sometimes what happens even we can use this forceps also for doing the capsulotomy because this is uh, having a uh, fine forceps like uh, we have got the tips which are very very fine but the basic thing for which this is made is for the suture tying for the suture tying so uh, we can actually hold the needle because you know uh, the needles that you are using in ophthalmology for suturing are the curved needles it is uh, like this so basically you require something angulated to hold the suture tying and uh, taking it uh, besides um, the tissue that you have to suture, you have to take it like this and then you have to do the suturing for that or maybe uh, when you want to hold the IOL and you have to take it inside. So that time also we, we require the angulated forceps. So basic purpose is for the suture time and for holding the IOL to take it inside but at times you know uh, you can use interchangeably if you do not have the cystitome then we can use it for the capsulotomy as well, right. All right, now see this. This is a good instrument uh, which you can easily identify. Can you see we have got a L shaped instrument? This is L shape. So, this L shape is actually called as L for L, right? Like S for S, that S shape was for superior rectus. This is L for L, that is it's a lens expressor. So it is made in such a way that it is hooking the thing so that it can hook the lens and it can take it out. That is why uh, it can also be replaced by the muscle hook. I will show you that muscle hook also. Now what is the position where it is applied? So basically if you are, uh, suppose this is the eye and you are standing here. 
So this will become the 12 o'clock position and this will become the 6 o'clock position, right, of the patient. So basically it is put it at this 6 o'clock position to deliver the nucleus in, in, in like this. You are putting it, you are hooking the nucleus and putting the pressure over that 6 o'clock so that it can hook it out. So you know delivery of the nucleus is again important. I will be uh, matching up all the steps of the cataract surgery while we are dealing with the instruments. You have given the incision, then cauterization, then you have made the gutter, the tunnel. And now we are coming for uh, the nucleus delivery. I will show you the instrument that will be used for your hydro dissection and the hydro delineation. We have seen the suture tying uh, like McPherson's forceps that was also there. Then anti-acapsulotomy you are doing with the help of cystitome. So I think now when you will uh, read the cataract surgery again, the steps, what is the meaning? It will be easier for you to correlate that how this thing will go on, right? Okay. Now see this, what is this? Um, can you see here, we have got a hook kind of a thing, it's a hollow. A hollow is there. So uh, if you see here, it is something uh, which is like this. So the hollow instrument that you see, this is actually called as the wire vectus. This is called as the wire vectus and you know wire vectus are actually of two types like here can you see here we have got the empty area here where you can uh, actually connect a syringe through which you can push the irrigating solution also uh, like for example um, if you want to do the hydro delineation like uh, you know every time you do the cataract surgery hydro dissection is a must right the basal salt solution with the glutathione is the best irrigating fluid you have to push it up so that you are separating the capsule from the cortex right now this cortex have to be Breaken, it has to be separated from the nucleus. Sometimes the nucleus also has to be separated into the epinucleus and the endonucleus. So, if that is the case, we can use this irrigating wire vectors. Otherwise, we can use the normal one which does not have irrigation, the normal wire vectors which will not have this portion and it will have just a plain handle. That is why this is actually called as modified vectors in which loop is made up of a wire and uh, the opening that is there, that opening is very, very small 0.3 mm. Right. Now, here you can see the posterior end, okay, is having a hollow handle where you can connect with the infusion set, but otherwise we can use the normal ones also and uh, why it is having su uh, such a small uh, loop or such a small opening so that you can hook that nucleus there and you can um, express the nucleus out. So, like uh, one was your lens expressor, right? Now, this is for the uh, those nucleus where you require hydro delineation also. So, for apply and uh, at this stage, you have to apply the pressure at the opposite level from your end at 12 o'clock. So, I think when you, uh, you are being asked about these instruments, like um, they will show you the lens expressor also and the wire vectors also. They can ask you that uh, why it was uh, used at 6 o'clock position and why this is used as a 12 o'clock position. So basically this is used to uh, deliver the nucleus by applying the counter pressure. So uh, in cases of the lens expressor, you are putting the direct pressure at 6 o'clock position in this way and that hook is helping to express. But here when you are using the infusion, you are using the counter pressure technique and you are infusing at 12 o'clock position. All right. Now, after this, uh, we will be talking about the irrigation, like uh, you have done the hydro uh, 
delineation, you have broken down the nucleus, you have expressed the nucleus. Now, what about the cortical matter? The remaining cortical matter or the remaining nuclear uh, matter has also to be aspirated so that you are having completely clear view there and you can go with the IOL entry. So, for that, we are using the Simcoe's two way irrigation and aspiration cannula. I think this is the easiest instrument. And uh, whenever the um, uh, students are given a choice to hold one instrument and tell its users, identify. This is the one they prefer because you know identification is not at all a problem with this. So this is your irrigation and aspiration cannula. After the nucleus delivery for the aspiration of the ramblin cortical matter, you are using it. Now, one more use. Sometimes when your viva is going good and examiner is expecting something extra from you and if you want to get that extra marks, then always remember it can also be used for the aspiration of the hyphema. Hyphema is again you know most common early post-operative complication of the cataract surgery and many a times when we open the padding and bandaging of the patient um, on the first post-op day after the cataract surgery you are get seeing the blood inside the anterior chamber and you want to aspirate it maybe the pressures are very very high and uh, you can't just rely on the head uh, end elevation or the bed rest so for that you can do the ac wash so for that ac wash also we can use this irrigation and aspiration cannula all right now the next one now can you see this this is again a forceps right but this forceps are having the blunt ends and again you can see a distance between the two prongs right so uh, when you are having the distance between its um, two um, blades here and plus they are blunt so that means again it is a spring action so it will have a spring action and uh, again it has a curved ends which will help in holding so one trick and tip to identify the instrument is see if they are closed or they are having some uh, distance if they are having some distance it is always a spring action and whenever they are uh, for the holding right for the holding then they are curved upwards and when they are for stabilization right then they are curved inwards okay now this is having the curved blades and uh, they are also blunt so basically they are for holding they are spring type and they are uh, there for holding something which is very very delicate so what is that that is your non foldable non foldable eye wells during the implantation so uh, the foldable ones uh, are not that uh, large because you know when you fold it you require the smaller instrument because you are doing it in the smaller incision surgery so they are the large curved ones so when you are uh, inserting the rigid one piece non foldable pmma eye well this is the instrument that you are going to use okay now see this uh, this is a very um, peculiar instrument very typical kind of an instrument which is called as the eye well dialer I will dial up. Can you uh, see its step here? It is something like this. So it's like a finger, uh, and uh, this you are uh, you will be uh, relating well if you have seen those old telephone sets in which we used to dial the number by uh, rotating our fingers over that. So can you see the shape of my finger when I? Uh, dialing the number there on the telephone set like this so it is the same shape they have made see after we have done the IOL entry and uh, we are trying to keep it over the posterior capsule you know that uh, posterior capsule in the bag implantation or the capsular bag implantation is the most preferred site it is the most preferred site for the IOL implantation so in order to be sure that uh, you are placing the IOL at the right position after putting it we need to dial it so if you have uh, seen the IOLs they are something like this right 
So we have got two uh, dialing holes here. So these dialing holes will help me to place it centrally accurately at its position so that you are not getting uh, the sunrise syndrome, the sunset syndrome or the windshield wiper syndrome, the lost lens syndrome. For all those purposes, we are putting it uh, and placing it, dialing it with the help of a IOL dialer. All right. Then coming to the next one, this is your capsule polisher. Now this is not a very basic instrument but uh, still it is there. Uh, actually uh, what, what happens uh, sometimes when you are doing the irrigation and aspiration of the cortical matter, some amount of matter may be adherent to it. Okay, So uh, in order to separate that adherent material which is actually adhered over the posterior capsule uh, before the IOL implantation you are doing it. So this is the instrument. Uh, it has a, a small bent neck right and then at the tip there is a very very small ring. Now don't confuse it with the vactors that was having much larger loop that was 0.3 mm and this is having much smaller one, much smaller one right. Okay, now we are uh, coming to the instruments which are used in the DCR surgery. Now though DCR surgery is much less common uh, in comparison to the cataract surgery but uh, because uh, we are doing and this is also the ophthalmology surgery, uh, let us take a quick look over these instruments. Now these are called as a trephines primary trephine, secondary trephine and what happens it has got a pointed tip in the middle and it is used to mark actually um, to mark the frontal process of the maxilla and the lacrimal bone the primary trephine the primary trephine has a has a pointed tip can you see both the trephines uh, if you see the topmost portion now if you see the tips one has a pointed tip this one is your pointed so how will you remember P for P, pointed tip is the primary trephine and the one having the blunt, blunt uh, end, this is your secondary trephine. So the moment you remember that the P for P, pointed is primary, you can already know that the secondary is with the blunt. Now what are the uses? The one which is having a pointed tip will help me mark the frontal process of the maxilla like here and the lacrimal bone because you know when you are doing the DCR surgery you have to create a communication a opening between the um, lacrimal bone and the middle meatus. So you require something pointed and then second is your secondary refine that is having the blunt end that is then used to make the opening. For making the opening you require something half T, you have to rotate it like this, this so that you can uh, make a good opening there. So for that purpose we are using the secondary trephine. Okay. Now this is a uh, important instrument and uh, I think uh, this will um, also uh, be easier to identify. Uh, this reminds me of that uh, paper punch when we are punching the papers to put in that uh, spring file. So we are punching it like this. So similarly this is a bone punch. This is actually Citelli's bone punch and uh, you know when you are creating an opening in cases of the DCR uh, that is a large opening that you have to make between the lacrimal bone and the middle meter. So obviously that a chunk of bone has to be removed. So that is done with the help of this uh, bone punch and I, uh, I have seen uh, the consultants doing this um, bone punch. Uh, the uh, crackling sound that you suddenly get uh, moment there is a bone punch you they uh, start remembering the carpenter's uh, noise. So that similar kind of a crackling noise comes when you do that uh, bone punch and a large amount of energy is also required because you know it's hard to do uh, the bone punch and create an opening there. 
and you know by the time you reach to the DCR surgeries you are already tired because you know they are the infected cases so they can't be taken in the morning. So once you are finished with all the surgeries uh, then you take uh, these cases in the last because you know these are the infected cases so th at that time you are already drained and exhausted and then lot of energy is required for doing this okay. Then your next one. Next is a chisel. Now this is just like a chisel, like chisel and hammer, you know. So this is just like a chisel and why we are using this, uh, sometimes there are very small uh, bones uh, you, in the uh, DCR surgery. You have done the main uh, uh, chunk of thing by the, this your bone punch and then you have to remove the small pieces. So with the help of this chisel, you are actually smoothing out the edges, doing all neat work. So at that time, you require the chisel okay then coming to the next one now see if you look at the its uh, tip I think it will become very very easy to identify this looking at the tip can you see uh, you are having a conical tip and it's a pointed very very pointed so basically its purpose is uh, when you are using uh, any uh, procedure to do over the lacrimal apparatus. So, uh, you have to do it from your outer opening, right? And what is your outer opening? You can see the punctums because, you know, every time um, you know that this is your upper punctum and this is your lower punctum. Then you have to follow the vertical canaliculi. Then you have to go in the horizontal canaliculi like this. Then it is opening in the lacrimal sac. And then is your nasolacrimal duct that will be opening into the inferior meatus. So when I want to do the syringing or when I want to do the probing, basically I have to follow these punctums. I have to go through these punctums. Can be upper punctum or it can be the lower punctum. So I need some space there. Okay, so for that we are using the punctum dilator. So we have got uh, the punctum dilator. We can dilate the punctum, uh, rotating it in the clockwise and the anti-clockwise fashion and see if now my probe can uh, pass through and uh, uh, we, we can do it uh, later. Uh, if, if one punctum is not doing, you, you can uh, try with a bigger one or again you can try and then again try if the probe is now going and you can carry on the procedure. So that is the use of the dilator. Now how do you do the probing? Can you see this is called as the Bauman's lacrimal probe. Uh, it is just a wire kind of a thing and uh, it's a probe because you know uh, when you, you are taking this probe inside, you have to see up to what level you are able to go inside and um, it has got two ends and both the ends can be used as a probe here. One is slight, uh, slightly blunted, one is slightly um, uh, tipped, fine tipped. So you can use uh, either way. If you feel like a uh, thinner one is now able to go, then you can go with the blunt one. Uh, initially, if you feel like that even that can also go, then you can start with the uh, larger lumen also. So basically, when uh, you study the congenital decryocystitis, so many things uh, that uh, suppose this is your eye, okay, and this is your um, middle canthus, we have a upper punctum, we have got the lower punctum right here. And then we have got the canaliculi, right? Uh, they are opening into your um, lacrimal sac. And this lacrimal sac will open in the nasolacrimal duct. Nasolacrimal duct will be opening in the inferior meatus, inferior meatus of the nose. Okay, now this has got a series of the valves here. We have got a lot of valves here in order to maintain the unidirectional flow of the tears. So, what happens in cases of the congenital decryocystitis? One of the valves gets enlarged. So, this is actually called as what you call as the membranous membranous occlusion. This is called as the membranous occlusion and this membranous occlusion will clog this pathway uh, due to which you will be having the lot of uh, 
accumulation of the tears and they will be back flowing and this will be leading to the tearing also. So, the you have to see basically that at what level you are having the problem uh, or the occlusion at what level. So, when you study this, uh, do you remember we studied that whether there is a hard stop or whether there is a soft stop. So, what is the meaning of this? See, when you follow this, this is your upper puncta this is your lower puncta, this is vertical canaliculi, this is horizontal canaliculi, this is your common canaliculi, right. So, suppose I am inserting the probe here. So, you are going like this, 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 this. So, when uh, you are stopping here, so if you are stopping here at the level of the common canaliculi, you will get a soft stop. Then this is called as a soft stop. But suppose the uh, occlusion is not at this level and you are going even more medially medially and you are stopped here and you are not able to go proceed further then here you will get the hard stop more medially you will get a hard stop hard stop because you are actually touching this lacrimal bone here so actually what is the meaning of the soft stop or the hard stop i think this must be very very clear to you now so now we'll be dealing with a very important instrument that is your enucleation spoon. So, as I told you from before also that uh, look at the shape of the instrument and you will not require the cramming of, of its name. Its name is enucleation spoon and look at the shape of the instrument. It is exactly like a spoon but you also have a groove here. Now, what is this? What is this groove actually? This is the groove for the optic nerve. This is the groove for the optic nerve. So, why it is required? Actually, uh, it is called as a spoon because it is a spoon shaped instrument. So, when you are doing the enucleation, now first of all, you should know the difference between enucleation, evisceration, and isanteration. And if you know its instruments, you will be very very thorough that what, why and where we are using what is the uh, concept behind it. Now see all three are the destructive procedures. Now enucleation means that you are doing the removal of the eyeball, whole of the eyeball. Now suppose you are removing whole of the eyeball. It is something like this, right? like this and behind the eyeball you will have the optic nerve which is coming out and then it is forming the chiasma from the other side. So, the moment I uh, have to remove this eyeball, I, I require something which can hook this optic nerve, okay. So, it can hook this optic nerve like this and this is your handle here like this. So, this is used as an optic nerve guide because when you are doing the enucleation, you have to remove the eyeball and you will also require to cut a part of the optic nerve because you know it is forming a chiasma with the other side optic nerve and that procedure is going on. So, this is for engaging the optic nerve during the enucleation, right. Now, I will be telling you about the evisceration and isenteration also. Now, see this. Second is your evisceration. This can be called as a curate or this can also be called as a scoop. Evisceration curate or the evisceration scoop. Scoop means like you have ice cream scoops. Can you see here? This is your scoop. It is just like, a, uh, like you cannot say it to be a spoon. Spoon is a uh, larger cover, cover area. This is scoop like we you take out the ice cream with the ice cream scoop. More uh, circular kind of a thing so that uh, when you remove it, you get the whole spherical, you know, when you uh, scoop out the ice cream with ice cream scoop and you put it over the cone, you get a, that rounded kind of a thing. So, that kind of instrument is this evisceration scoop and um, evisceration scoop, now why we are using a scoop here and why not we are using the spoon here? The reason is that what is evisceration? You are cutting uh, the sclera. Um, because you know there you have to leave the sclera okay in the enucleation you are taking out whole of the eyeball and you are engaging the optic nerve but in cases of the evisceration we are actually 
giving the uh, opening in the outer coat. So it can be at the level of cornea or it can be at the level of sclera uh, on the top. So right, so what you are doing, you are giving an opening in the fibrous coat, then you are scooping out the uveal contents, all things scooping out. So for that you require some scoop like thing or a curate like thing. Like when we do the DNC, then also you have to curate it out, okay. So you have to do, then you have to place the artificial implant and you have to suture it back. So that is why in the evisceration you are using the scoop. Now there is one more scoop that is used, uh, uh, that can be used as an evisceration scoop. See this is having a larger one. So but again, can you see the shape? It is not like a spoon. This is a scoop. So either you can get this kind of a scoop also or you can get this kind of a scoop. And um, in the further slides you will see that even a smaller kind of a scoop can be used in ophthalmology. But that is even for a, a more small things. That is for the calyzion. So even a smaller to this a scoop if it is used then that will be a calyzion scoop. Right. Then coming to the next one. So, this you have already seen, this is your Lacrimal's Bowman's prop, okay, that we were using. This is your uh, punctum dilator, you have do, done this, okay. Now, this is the small cup, a very, very small cup with a very narrow handle that is used for the calyzion. Can you see, very, very tiny one. So, this is your calyzion scoop. Now, what is calyzion? And why you require the scoop here? Calyzion is a lid infection. It is the most common um, type of a lid infection that you are getting uh, in the chronic uh, people. It's a nodular one showing a lipogranulomatous, lipogranulomatous inflammation. It is non-separative. It is non-separative, no pus you are getting here. It is different from external hordulum or the internal hordulum. It's not a sty where you are getting a pus point just on the outer side. It is on the inner side, nodular thick. So when you avert the eyelid, you get a, a large bulge there. Okay, so that for that you require to scoop out the contents. Now for scooping out the contents, you have to give the incision and for giving the incision, you need to stabilize. So for that, you require a separate set of instruments that we will be dealing. See, the IOL dialer, dialer we have already seen. Okay, now uh, IOL dialer looks very very similar to another instrument that is called as a iris repositor. You have to reposit the iris back that is very evident from its name itself. Now if you look at the dialer, the shape of the dialer was something like this you know bent uh, finger kind of a thing because it will help in dialing the IOL. But if you look at the iris repositor, the uh, edge is little curved because this will help me in swiping the iris back. So when it is required, it uh, has two purpose. One is when iris has come out, you know iris prolapse is a well known complication that can take place in the early post operative period of the cataract surgery. So that is but obvious so at that time I will use the iris repositor. But one more extra to gain that extra edge, it will also help me in breaking the sinecki. Right, whenever we have uh, sinecki, uh, you know, posterior sinecki, you know, anterior sinecki and uh, I require something very delicate so that I cannot uh, puncture the uh, iris, I do not create any false holes there, I do not lead to the trophy of the iris. So there again, in order to break that sinecki, I can use this iris repositor. So both of them, the IOL dialer and iris repositor are the sleek model instruments and look Looking at the tip, you can easily identify whether it's a repositor or whether it's a dialer. Okay, uh, two-way irrigation and aspiration cannula, we have seen this. Wire vectors, it's a wire looped attached to a metallic handle that again you have seen. Now the calyzion clamp. See, I told you that um, 
when you have to work on the calisyon you have to scoop out the contents first you have to stabilize the calisyon so uh, how to stabilize that calisyon for that we are using this calisyon clamp in this clamp what is there screw is there you can uh, put the calisyon in between this clamp and then we can screw it tighten it for the stabilization now the one end is the solid end and another end is your ring end solid end and the ring end so what you have to remember is that the solid part is actually um, kept on the skin side so again you can remember s for s solid side on the skin and this ring portion has to be kept at the calisyon side at the calisyon side so if you are uh, holding the clamp here so we can put the solid side here and i can avert it and then the calisyon will come in this ring portion so you have stabilized it now on the most pointed area we can give a vertical incision why i give a vertical incision over the calisyon uh, uh, towards the conjunctival side we give a vertical incision so that i can prevent the cutting of the meibomian ducts and then after giving the incision i will scoop out the contents so i have a clamp and i have a scoop both are different now one more clamp uh, that is used in uh, ophthalmology is your lid clamp that is called as a anthropion clamp or a lid clamp now can you see this instrument again you can see that it is a clamp we are having a screw action but look at its shape it is much larger it is engrossing whole of the eyelid here here again you have got two parts one is your ring part and one is your solid part okay but here it is opposite you are putting the ring part over the eyelid and solid part below so that you can stabilize it because here the purpose is different you have to work on the lids so if i cover it with the solid part i won't be able to perform it so here i am putting the solid part below and the ring part here so that i can do the surgeries of the eyelids now what are the surgeries um, that i i need to do right i i can do the anthropion surgeries the ectropion surgeries the ptosis all these things can be done here okay so uh, like uh, previously we used to use a lid spatula a lid spatula was something uh, like this previously we used to use this lid spatula but i think this one is a better this is your self uh, retaining also and uh, therefore we do not require a uh, assistant to hold so that i told you for the speculum also self retaining speculum because you know if if i require this spatula to be placed here so there should be someone all the time by my side till the time i do the surgery holding the lid spatula like this and only then i can perform the surgery so i think this is a better alternate so this was about the clamp then we have got a very very delicate uh, forceps can you see the tiny um, uh, 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 forceps we are having very very small blades very very small blades this is uh, for the most delicate part of the eye when you are cutting a very delicate portion that is your iris okay so this is having very fine tools so that you do because you know we at times require the teeth because you require the holding of the iris but at the same time they should not be very large tooth so that you do not uh, cause a trauma to the iris and they are again having uh, separated okay so this will help me in cutting in the wedge shaped areas in the cutting of the wedge shaped areas so whenever we require the iridectomy we are require the cutting of the um, iris it can be for the cataract for the glaucoma or you are doing the peripheral iridectomy right or you are doing the optical iridectomy anything or you even if you want to cut that prolapsed tissue uh, of the iris repositor is for repositing but for cutting you require the prolapsed tissue cutting then again you require this iris forceps or sometimes there is some entangled foreign body over the iris and you want to remove it then also you can use it so basically it is for the iris manipulation okay then this was your calman macpherson forceps for the suture tying for the capsulotomy that this we have done now there is one more scissors this is called as a d wicker scissors can you see this is uh, a different kind of a scissor and um, you can see 
a D forming here. D Wecker scissors and this is making a typical V here. Typical V, uh, I'll make it here so that you can see the blades here. Typical V it is making. So, this is again a spring action and making a wedge shaped uh, dis, uh, cutting. So, this can be used uh, instead of the iris uh, for uh, forceps also. You can use it for the iridectomy or for cutting the pupillary membrane. Sometimes there is persistent uh, primary hyperplastic membranes. You have to cut those or you have to cut some adhesions, sinicky for all those. So, it's a multi purpose scissors that you can use it. Then uh, this is uh, a needle holder. Can you see here? See holder here. So you do not have the blades which are very very separate. They are uh, uh, very uh, much uh, close to each other and uh, the area is very very small because this is actually a needle holder. Needle holder. Like we were using the Macpherson's forceps also and this, this is a spring action needle holder. This also can be used for the suture tying. You are doing the suturing on conjunctiva, cornea, sclera, extra cla muscles while doing the, um, the squint surgeries. So this option you can also use the spring action needle holder. Okay. Now I told you that there is one more instrument that can be used in place of the lens expressor and that is called as a muscle hook. Look at uh, the shape here. It is again L shaped. I told you L for L lens expressor. Then how come this is a hook? See the tip here. The tip is rounded because this has to be uh, hooking the muscle which is a delicate belly. Uh, extraocular muscles are very very uh, you know delicate. So at that time we are using the blunted area but otherwise both can be used interchangeably. I can use a lens expressor uh, instead of a muscle hook. I can use a muscle hook instead of a lens expressor right. So when I am doing uh, any surgery where actually we require to deal with extracular muscles, uh, basically the squint surgery or um, the enucleation surgery or when you are doing the retinal detachment, scleral buckle has to be placed and uh, uh, 360 degree and uh, clutch operation has to be done. That time also you need to hook the extracular muscles, you can use this muscle hook. See this was your uh, lens expressor, can you see here and this is your muscle hook. Can you see? When you see them um, side by side, you are able to recognize which one is your muscle hook and which one is your lens expressor. Okay. Now comes to uh, important instrument. Now here identification is not a problem. You can see the calipers here, right? You can see the markings uh, here. So basically this is a castrovijo calipers which is used for the measurement. So where do I require the measurements when I am doing the squint surgery I require perfect measurements when I am doing the torsus surgery I require the measurements or when I am doing the PPV pars plena vitrectomy in order to make sure that I am going through the pars plena you have to measure the distance from the limbus again I will be using it or suppose I want to make it whether it's a microcornea or it's a megalocornea you have to see the iris diameter. Uh, at all those uh, places, we will use this castrovijo calipers. C for C, castrovijo corneal calipers. Basically, it can be used for the corneal dimensions also, right? Then you have already done this universal metallic eye spaculum can be used for both. So, you have done this. Now this is a very interesting instrument. It is just like a snake sitting here. Dasmere's retractor. So it is actually the saddle shaped, folded on itself. Um, this is basically a one instrument which is a very um, polite, but it will help in. Um, examination of the eyeball. Uh, sometimes the children are not cooperative and you can't be very harsh on them or uh, maybe the congenital glaucoma where there is a blepharospasm. So for those purposes we can use uh, this Dasmere's retractor in order to retract the eyelids. So the moment you see its shape you will see we can hook the eyelid and we can retract. So this is basically used for retraction of the eyelids. 
So this is all for the instruments. I think uh, most of the instruments that are concerned uh, with your uh, uh, NEET PG examination, your prof examination, the FMG examinations I have covered because these are the most common surgeries that you study in ophthalmology and because you know this is not uh, being very very uh, much covered and you are not so much exposed to these instruments uh, in your third years or while you are doing the internship. It becomes at times difficult to understand undergo uh, the uh, understanding of these surgeries properly. So I have tried to cover the theoretical as well as the practical part of the instrument. Basically how to identify the instrument and based on its identification what are its specific uses there you can use it. So I think this will uh, be helping uh, you. Do uh, write me in the comment section. Uh, did you like this video? Please like, share and subscribe. Uh, share this video to your colleagues whom you think are uh, needing this video so that we can reach the maximum uh, students who need this uh, in the times of the uh, COVID especially when the students are not able to go to the wards they are really missing it and that's why I uh, tried to cover up this because I was getting so many messages on my like mailbox that uh, we require a discussion on instruments and uh, make it happen. Thank you and happy ophthalmology.